Like skeletons and tombstones rising from the marsh, the weathered remains of these pine trees are all that is left of a forest that once stood on the edge of the tidal Severn River. These ghost forests aren't a mystery, though. They're a reminder of the forces reshaping land, livelihoods, and the rural economy along Virginia's coast. Virginia is part of a really well-known hotspot for sea level rise. Uh, sea level rise rates in Virginia are above five millimeters per year. They're among the fastest in the United States, and they're fast because not only is the water rising, but the land is sinking as well. And you put those two things together, combined with a really flat topography, and even just a little bit of sea level rise would inundate a big section of land. Dr. Matt Kerwin is a coastal scientist at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science and a leading researcher in understanding how sea level rise affects the land and communities around the Chesapeake Bay. Rural Virginia, rural parts of the Chesapeake Bay, if anything, are more vulnerable to sea level rise and, and what the impacts look like are a lot more subtle. They look like this, where I'm standing was probably forest about 50 years ago and it's now converted to marsh. And it happens just slow enough that it's hard to recognize. I mean, we've always had dead trees at the edge of marshes, that's nothing new, but it's happening faster and faster. And you lose a few trees every year, and before you know it, what used to be dry land one generation, two generations ago, has now converted to wetlands. On the nearby North River, homeowner David Haslip has seen the effects of saltwater intrusion on his pine trees firsthand. It's very depressing because they're majestic. Uh, they provide a lot of shade and uh, just the view from the river of the towering trees on our property is very important to us. We've probably lost around six of our trees uh, just in the last five years. Like many coastal Virginians, Haslip and his family love waterfront life, but the reality of increasingly higher tides and ever more common yard floods has set in. Around here, flooding is a very gradual. It just starts creeping in. And um, I remember the first one I had, and I kept looking out and seeing the water coming up, and I thought, well, when does it stop? After repeated floods, Haslip noticed that the tops or crowns of his majestic pines were turning brown. Lisa Deaton, a forester with the Virginia Department of Forestry, explains why. We always are looking when we drive into the property, you'll see the brown tops of the trees. And with a pine tree, once the top has turned brown, the whole tree is about to die. Typically, it's pine bark beetles have moved in and caused the final insult to the tree that's killed it. They carry a blue stain fungus that kills the vascular system of the tree. You can see thinning crowns, which is usually a sign of the saltwater inundation stressing the trees when they first started growing here were planted here. Um, there was probably a higher degree of fresh water that they were able to put their root system into and then over time with more high king tides coming in and more salt left behind in the soil um, the tree's health is affected and then the tree is stressed. The beetles can tell that the tree is stressed and they move in. Um, raise their babies and move out. While the Haslips have lost the shade and beauty of their pines, Deaton says that coastal timberland owners see significant economic losses. One of the first aha moments with coastal change in forests uh, came to me when a landowner who had reforested 50 acres in Matthews County uh, who didn't live in Matthews wanted to know how her trees were doing, if she could harvest her timber. Uh, and when we went out there and looked at the map and used the satellite images, there was really 23 or 28 acres of forest left and the rest of it, had the, the plantation of 50 acres had been uh, decimated really by saltwater intrusion. But while the loss of forest and forest habitat is challenging both environmentally and economically, Dr. Kerwin says there is a silver lining. The nice thing, at least in this part of Gloucester, is that that loss hasn't been for nothing. We've gotten something back. We've gotten salt marsh to take its place. And we're actually standing in a, in a salt marsh here that most people wouldn't recognize as being only 50 years old. Uh, this looks very much like a salt marsh that you would expect in a place where marshes have been for thousands of years. Marshes are considered one of the most ecologically and economically valuable ecosystems in the entire world. They're right up there with tropical rainforests and coral reefs. They are enormously productive. There's some statistics out there that indicate that a marsh grows as much biomass in a year 
as an irrigated, fertilized farm on prime soils out in the, in the Midwest. The biomass that grows here, uh, in another month or two, it'll, it'll die back, and a lot of that biomass will end up feeding um, the estuaries and the base of the food chain for all of the uh, important fish and seafood that, that we love. And Deaton says that the key for coastal homeowners is to go with the flow. I always encourage people to work with Mother Nature um, and look to see, well, what is growing here and what's doing well? Think ahead for the grandchildren. What would you like to plant here and get something growing to be your next shade trees that can tolerate these extreme conditions of being on the edge of salt water? To learn more about ghost forest and adapting to sea level rise, home and timber landowners can visit vims.edu or dof.virginia.gov. From Gloucester County, Virginia, I'm Elijah Griles.